Yeah. Hi, everybody. Now, the good thing about going last is you know what everybody said. The bad thing about going last is everybody's stolen all your best material and all your best jokes. And I had one left. I had one joke left. And Gavin announced he was the second person standing between you and beer. So rest assured, I'm going to go through this quickly and get you out to happy hour. Um, the good news is I think everybody today has said some amazing things about customer satisfaction, whether they've said them as part of support or running an agency or pitching. It's been really heartening how many people here have been so, so focused on customer satisfaction. And I think that's you know, what Shopify is all about, making our clients and their customers happy. Um, and customer satisfaction probably doesn't sound sexy, but I want to tell you probably what is the you know, agency person's holy grail of customer satisfaction. A client rang me yesterday, and I'm like, oh god, what's broken? He's like, no, 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 mate of mine needs a site. I'm like, okay, well, you know, happy to help. What can we do? What does he need to know? No, 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 send me your questionnaire. I'm over there in half an hour. I'm going to fill it out with him so you can start building. I was like, okay, that's probably the perfect sales process. And it doesn't come from the sales process. It comes from customer satisfaction. So a lot of these things we're going to talk about today I'll gloss over because other people have talked about them far better than me. Um, but let's just take it from the top. I think the, the key thing that's come up again and again today is choose your customer. There are going to be customers that you can serve really well, there are going to be customers that you can serve, and there are going to be customers that you regret. Um, regardless, you've then got to nurture them and build them up to some of your biggest advocates, and then maintain that relationship going forward. Now, I'm going to Jim let Fry and Laurie... you, young Master Jarrett, how may we serve? Well, I was after a pair of shoes. Ah, very well, I shall serve them first. So in the event of a shot of Red Bull and uh, quite a bit of caffeine, I'm hoping that's got everybody vaguely revived for the afternoon session. Um, what I want to do is tie some of those things, both in the presentation and previous speakers, together. Uh, because all for, although when you first think it, it's like, what on earth has that got to, to do with customer service? But actually, it nails a lot of key points. Um, and the first one is niche. They're not selling shoes. Um, has anybody done a shoe website? Has anybody done a shoe rental website? Yeah, although I have to admit our one wasn't renting them by the hour, although I'm too scared to ask now. Um, so choose your niche. As a business, that means what do you do well? And I think the most scary customer we get, or scary client we get, is the one that comes in and says, I want to sell X. And you say, well, OK, who do you want to sell it to? Who's your niche? And they're like, oh, a woman over sort of 18 and younger than 60. But actually, men could use it too. And you say, where do you want to sell it? Oh, all over the world. And you're left there thinking, that's not a niche. That's a disaster waiting to happen. Yet often, as practitioners ourselves, we fall into exactly the same error. We're terrified that we won't get enough business and that everybody else is going to outcompete us, but we try and do everything. And I think other, other speakers today have said you know, great things about choose a niche, choose a blue sea niche, not a red one, um, and make sure you can totally win in that niche. And there's a lot of niches to go around. Offering. In the shoe shop, they were very clear that they weren't selling shoes, and they, were sell you know, they had a particular offering. It was very narrow, and they were very clear about what the pricing was on that. Um, they played to their strengths, which clearly wasn't a shoe salesman. Um, they had tools there, not so clear from the video. Um, they built a relationship with their client, uh, although I'm not sure that the peephole joke was really going to be good for a long-term relationship with their client if they weren't offering confidentiality. Um, and you know, they had the people to deliver, uh, if you like Stephen Fry's delivery. Um, and you know, no evidence there of improving, but they were clearly playing to their customers' expectations. So. How do we do that in our business? There is a niche for all of us. And by doing what we do really well, we can offer great customer service uh, without trying to dilute ourselves or do too much or do what we do badly. Um, industry. Who here does a lot of sports sites? Yep. Um, baby sites. I think the e-chicks can all raise their hands really high on that. Fashion. 
Yeah, so everybody here is playing to some sort of niche already. Um, and we'll also find that you do really well when you're focusing on a particular business size. And we've talked about enterprise level players and who's got the depth on the bench to play to them. But for every enterprise level client, there are a whole lot of newbies uh, who need things like, you know, introduction to business 101, which for some of us is brilliant. We're really good at doing that. And there's obviously, a, a, obviously an interplay between size and business life stage, although you do get some very mature businesses that are still quite small. And lastly, geography and language. Um, the ability to pick up the phone and solve a problem is huge. And I think, you know, being realistic about how many time zones away we can solve those problems is really key. Um, otherwise, you start to be up at 3 a.m. in the morning trying to deal with everything, which means that by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you're not offering anybody good service. Uh, and the same with language. If you can't understand your client in that original phone call, it's going to be a lot worse by the end of the project when you're trying to discuss the nitty-gritty. And I want to tell you a story about how I ended up in the niche I did. When I first came into IT, it was about 2011. And I had to brand and build a website and do all those good things. And um, I came from Accenture, which is one of the big management consultancies, and uh, was coming into web for the first time. And I was terrified that my customers would find out that I was female and not 21, um, you know, and not a skinny white male with a mohawk and a barcode tattoo, because that seemed to be the prototype of a web developer in 2011. I think now it also involves a beard and a man bun, but I can't do either of those, sadly. So I branded myself with a really bland orange logo and a grayish orange website, and um, you know, very standard professional sounding copy, and off I went. And about business was okay. About six months in, I stopped and thought, hang on, all of my business is coming from word of mouth. They're all women. They're all selling fashion or baby products. And the first thing out of their mouth when they've introduced themselves is, my God, thank you. You're not scary. So I think my opening sales pitch now is effectively, I'm Kim, and I'm not scary. So you know that thing that I was most scared of in my business turns out to be my biggest selling point. And we changed our name to eChic. We put a bit of pink in our logo, and suddenly all of those clients who hadn't realized who we were were calling us in even greater numbers. So by being who you can be well, it does great things for your business because there are other people that can't do that well. But there's a huge number of fields that we can all play well in. I think we've probably all got a customer horror story out there. And Continuous improvement, you've probably got a list either in your head or on your computer so that when clients call up, um, you can kind of immediately spot those warning signs. And my favorite one was somebody who called and told me that they'd had six disastrous web developers. Um, now, I don't know about you, but I didn't regard that as a challenge. I ran like hell. Um, so you know, I think that is a key warning sign. Everybody can have one bad experience. I did have one beautiful client who'd had two. Uh, beyond that, I'm sorry, but you're on your own. And I think um, Bex had a really good comment about previous providers. You know, you don't get into a bad-mouthing of their previous provider, and if they are bad-mouthing their previous provider, what on earth are they going to say about you down the track? You know, don't, don't risk it. Um, Expectations. I think everybody, especially early in the relationship, wants to assume that they'll get everything. And some clients are very good at assuming that if it wasn't explicitly out, it's in. So getting a sense of where their expectations are is a really good way of judging, is this customer for you or not? Um, realistic timelines. Has anybody had the phone call, I've got a trade show on Saturday? The other, yeah. <laughs> the other one I've had is, um, we've just had an internet post go, uh, sorry, we've had a Facebook uh, meme go viral. Uh, we had two million visitors to our site yesterday, and it's crashed. Now, to be honest, in that case, I cleared my books and worked on that site, because they clearly had a business model and had a reason for wanting it in the rush. Um, but you know, the, well, if you knew you had a trade show on Friday, why didn't you call us four weeks ago? is my sort of reason, or my internal reason, to a lot of those requests. If they're that disorganized in calling you in the first place, how disorganized are they going to be through the rest of the project? Um, but it's important to say no nicely. I mean, A, we're all human. We all deserve to be treated kindly. Um, but it is important to, 
up front to say, look, I don't think I can serve you well. Um, and look, you may know of somebody who can, either because they do different work or they work differently, and in that case, pass them on. But it really is important to weed out those duds early on. Um, one of the questions I've learned to ask recently is, are you an understudy bankrupt? Because at the point they are, the number of payment solutions they can use is pretty much zero, um, and you've got a failed project on your hands up front. And it's an awful question to have to ask somebody early on, um, but it is an important one in weeding out what's going to be a very, very troublesome project. Offering, and I think don't offer any, everything is key, especially when you're just starting up and you've got bills to pay. Um, and I think Beck touched on this. You want to offer everything so that you can actually get some money in the bank and pay your staff. Um, but it's you know, very easy to do a lot, not very well. And it also means you've got to have a huge range of staff to do a huge range of things, not very well. So by looking at what has worked well for you in the past and standardizing on that, and one of the beautiful things of making the mistake early on and trying to do everything, is at least you got a lot of data on what worked well and what, worked, what didn't. So you, know, you do have to kind of feel around and feel what works for you, but <laughs> by not failing, you don't actually get the data you need to succeed. So package up what's worked well, and then think about what's not in the package. You know, the shoe shop knew very well that they weren't going to sell those shoes, no siree. Um, they had a clear list of exclusions, and that's something, if you can get it into your, you know, your sales pitch, will make your life much easier. Um, define and refine is one that is absolutely key for us. We have a very defined range of offerings, um, and by refining them, we <coughs> should be able to package them beautifully. And um, anybody who's seen our proposals knows that we're not as good at that as we quite should be. But it does mean that it's very tightly written. It gets all the information that we're asked over and over. And as we have a project that, you know, there is some confusion about scope or questions that keep coming up over and over, because we've got those tightly defined packages, we can go back, update that documentation, and make sure that for the next circuit, we do better. Um, and once again, all my best material has been taken already. Price so you can deliver. Um, Gavin, sorry, what did you call it? Was it a fluffy fund? No, a, fifth, you, a flexi fund. There we go. Um, <laughs> I, I knew there was an F in it. Um, sorry. The idea of having a bit of extra leeway in there so that if things aren't going so well, you've got the budget to actually fix it. And while keeping everybody's morale up, not feeling like you're doing a complete scope creep, um, just means that you get to the end of the project and everybody's still friends. It also means that you've got that flexibility. There's going to be a number of requests, and you can deliver the price as, for the price promised without having to go, oh, that'll be extra. Um, so, you know, I think we're both on the same page there, that that's a great way, especially if you are fixed pricing, and, you know, we're fixed pricing disciples too, that you can still fix price while putting enough flexibility into it that you know, you don't have that constant battle against scope that really irritates customers when they don't quite understand the whole technical thing and what's in scope and what's not. People. Um, I think, you know, the, your people are the people that provide customer service. And your customer service is only ever as good as the people that provide it. Um, and we saw that you know, in the video, he's got quite an unusual delivery method. Um, clearly memorable, but not necessarily you know, the prime of customer service. Um, choosing carefully. And one of the lines I love is, you know, select for intelligence and select for diligence. You can pretty much train anything else, but you can't make people smarter, and it's very hard to make them hard, harder working without some sort of constant carrot and stick. Um, and then when you've got those great people, train them really hard. And that's a, that's a real internal commitment, especially when you're small. Um, there's 11 of us at eCheck, so you know, training a person is, is quite labor-intensive for us. Um, but it's worth doing because it means you get them up and running, and they're not going to mess up your first couple of customers. Um, supporting them well. There's been some great ideas today about um, apps like Asana, Trello, uh, Slack, lots of different ways of providing support to your staff so they can do great work. A couple of others I'd add to that list are Basecamp for project management, um, and Zapier just for gluing all your apps and the business together. Is anybody else here a Zapier user? 
gear. Um, it's a really great tool for just automating all the little jobs you've got to do in the business. And it just makes things so much easier in so many ways. So if you haven't tried out Zapier, I strongly recommend it. Um, and by, by using those tools, you can develop a whole lot of job aids that mean that providing great customer service is easy. You know, people think of customer service as the polish you put on the car as it goes out the door. You can't put lipstick on a pig. You've got to deliver a great, great service as the central tenant of your customer service. Otherwise, you're just trying to pick up the pieces later. Um, and philosophy, once again, somebody's touched on this earlier, but that philosophy has to go all the way through your business, and it's got to come from the top. If your staff see you cutting corners, bitching about customers, you know, in general, not living that customer service vision, um, then it's going to go all the way down. And I want to give a call out to Brad and Anne up in the team from out of the sandbox, because to my mind, they are the holy grail of customer service. If you've ever used Retina, Responsive, Mobilia, or Parallax, or Turbo, um, and been on the receiving end of Brad, who never sleeps, when you want to answer a question, um, you really know what good customer service is all about. So thank you. Um, and reviewing and improving. So much of what we do, especially when you've got your you know, first few clients, you're going to get it wrong, just because that's human nature, or at least you're not going to get it all right. And nobody ever does you know, the first time or even the 101st time. But the goal should be to get it right more and more often and to get less catastrophic wrongs. Um, my favorite book on this subject is Good to Great by Jim Collins. Um, he has a thing about always rinsing your cottage cheese, which to me is an absolutely horrible analogy, but it's that concept of always trying to do it better uh, and always just slowly improving your performance at the edge. It also means that you don't make the same mistake twice, and that's something that's always very reassuring, reassuring for my customers. It's like, you know, don't worry, we've made most of these mistakes once already. That's why you're paying us, to save you from making them yourself. We've made them, we've learned from them, and we've documented them. We can make new and better mistakes. The other thing about people, and I find this is often the hardest one in any business, is don't hire clones. I think looking at all of our teams sitting together today, we're generally alike in a lot of ways, whether that be gender, whether that be age, whether that be the way we dress. It's very easy, and for, philosophy, you know, for your business philosophy, you do tend to hire people who are quite similar to you. Um, and that makes it difficult, because you want a varied team so you can speak the language of all your different clients. Um, so I think we've done a reasonable job of that at Ichik. Um, Nisha here is, well, I'd like to say she's our debt collection department, but actually she's one of our graphic designers. Um, so obviously, in all things fitness, she can talk the client's language. And, you know, there is always the debt collection option. Um, you know, we've got people on the team who can talk, to, talk musical instruments. Uh, we've got a former power station engineer who's only ever wanted to be an interior decorator. Go figure. Um, you know, we've, we've got the drag queen brother-in-law that we can always refer to with questions about that. We've got people with tattoos, we've got people without tattoos, we've got people with children, without children, who can play basketball. I can't jump. Um, you know, there's a whole range of people there, so that when our customers want a specific skill, um, you know, we can talk Alsatian, we can talk kitty cat, we can talk their language. Um, and I think that's one of the hardest things for hiring, is trying to make sure that you don't get people just like you, because it's quite confronting dealing with somebody who's not just like you. But if you don't, you can't offer really great service to your customers, because you can't be just like them, and more importantly, just like their customers. Um, so tools really important to support that customer service with tools. Project management, I think we've heard about Asana, we've heard about Trello, we've heard about Basecamp. Anybody else got any favorites that they want to give a shout out? No. Um, internal and external communication, I think one of the problems we're finding more and more now is that email is getting less and less reliable. Uh, so tools like Slack have come up, you know, Facebook groups for social communication, that sort of thing. Um, make it easy for your team to get things right, and make it easy for your customers to contact you. The other thing about tools is they make the process much more efficient. By documenting it up the wazoo, it means that anybody can pick up that process doc or that base camp list or whatever and execute the task really well, even if it's their first time doing it. It also makes it much more reviewable because you've got a checklist to review against. 
Um, and that also helps out with the status and monitoring, especially if you're trying to bring new people on. It's easy to pick where they're up to and what you need to look after. Um, and the whole constant improvement thing comes back into your tools. When we learn something, we write it up into the base camp task description, or we write it up into the scope document, or we write it up into the pitch. So giving yourself those tools that let you improve constantly should mean over time it gets easier and easier to give better and better customer service. Um, and the other thing I think is consistency. Our clients come to us with a lot of fear. They've often been let down before. Sometimes they won't meet us if we're purely virtual. Um, they have no real guarantee at the end of the day whether they're going to get a project. And that's really confronting for them. And it, it's hard for us to, to kind of understand that ourselves because we're like, well, we know we'll deliver. We deliver. We have hundreds of projects. We deliver. But they don't, unless they've come from a word of mouth, they really don't have complete reassurance of that. So by being able to show that you are consistently good throughout the process, whether that be in getting the scope document to them as agreed quickly or understanding what their requirements are, Providing a consistency of experience is better than providing brilliant, okay, brilliant, awful, brilliant. Yeah. You're going to get a much better response and you know, much better Shopify feedback if you can do that. Now, I use this slide deck to, to make a point about um, one of the more painful conversations you're probably going to have with your client, which is, you know, we've got designers on our team. Most of the slide decks today looked amazing. You're going to have customers who come to you who've got very specific ideas about what they want. They may have already bought Sunrise theme. And you know, half the time, it's brilliant. They know exactly what their end customers are looking for in a website. The other half the time, it's because that was what was popular last time that they worked in PowerPoint, and it was, you know, they haven't moved on in the last five years. So you've got to be able to kind of go, it's not just about, I want something that looks great in my portfolio. It's, I am serving my client and my client's customer. And it's got to be a website and a design look that isn't just the latest and greatest and most edgy. It's got to be what the client likes, because if they don't like it and feel comfortable talking it up at the Chamber of Commerce or you know, plugging it on Facebook or advertising it for AdWords, it's not going to work. It can be the best site in the world. It can tick all the design boxes, but the client has to love it. And also, the, the client's customer has to love it. And I think that can be very difficult when we're all sort of designy and want it to look like the latest, you know, whatever's popular in design. But if your customers don't want that because, you know, they've got you know, older eyes, for example, were a huge problem when Parallax came out. Everybody with bifocals was getting seasick. Um, You've got to really think about what works for the customer and what they think is good design, not what sits there and makes us cringe. I'm not saying you have to use Comic Sans, but you have to be very, very, very tactful having that conversation with your customer about why you don't want to. Um, so, so that you can have those conversations, build the relationship, find out what makes them tick. Why do they love doing this? You know, what makes them want to get out and do it? Um, and I think talk is a key one. My favorite phrase about emails, email is the cask wine of communication. You'll find that issues that get emailed back and forth will get slowly more and more and more and more and more and more and more, and more tetchy until there's a giant battle brewing about what was you know, a two-inch scope creep. So pick up the phone wherever possible and talk about it. And things will come out in the chat that you know, will never have come out in email. And I think somebody was saying, you know, Clients are human too. They'll be having a bad day. You know, they'll, have, they'll have got up and had a fight with the wife that morning. That's what sparked the email in the first place. Um, and I don't know if any of you have ever had clients who are lovely face-to-face -face or you know, on the phone. Their writing style is best described as officious. Um, you know, sometimes the minute they start to type, it's just horrible. And by picking up the phone, you realize, actually, they're not angry. It's just how they communicate. So you can diffuse the situation a lot by picking up the phone. Be proactive. It's really, really, really easy to let things fester in your inbox, uh, especially that kind of, oh, God, I don't feel up to it now. I'll call them tomorrow. It's always good to leave people half an hour to calm down if you've had that angry missive. But you know, don't let the sun go down on it, or at least call first thing in the morning if you think they'll be better first thing in the morning. Um, 
Now, we do have that one client that used to get drunk and leave us you know, offensive voicemails, but we don't have him anymore, shall we say. Um, finish well. I think that's something that many, many, many of us are really bad at because you've got the next client bang for a website and you know, there's the next crisis and the next crisis and the next thing to do and the next deadline. And it's like, well, the website's done, it's all good. But you know, when you buy a car at the dealership, they give it a really good polish and a ribbon and everything and should drive it out. Do that because it's what makes the difference to customers, A, telling their friends about you, and B, um, you know, leaving good support or good uh, feedback with Shopify. And this is something we're really bad at, uh, but when we do it, it's incredibly powerful. So it's one of my sort of things to improve on, because uh, when, when we do it, it works really well. I just need to be more consistent at doing it. Ways of finishing well. I mean, the really blindingly obvious one is finish it. Um, and pay, setting up your payment methods to reflect that is a really good way of confirming to yourself and the client that they are happy that you have finished it. We have a three-stage payment approach, um, and the final 20% isn't paid until we have a warranty period and they agree that, yeah, it's done. So by them paying that, it's very clear communication that you know, we think it's finished and they think it's finished. Um, and that also acts as basically our formal sign-off. And then the other one that's quite powerful, and <clears throat> I think we're about three months over June, Nicole, is sat surveying satisfaction. Because by going back to clients, you'll find, A, if there is one little niggle that's still worrying them, um, or if they're actually really, really happy when you maybe thought they weren't. So it's quite good to get that survey satisfaction. We do a stop, start, continue question, which is, what would we stop doing? What should we start doing? And what should we continue doing? And that's a, typically a good way of getting something like, look, I felt a bit like to and fro between these people. I wasn't quite sure who was in charge of what. You know, I want you to start communicating better the roles of people in the team. And that was a bit of feedback we took on board. So now one of the first things we do is communicate who does what um, and the fact that who to complain to. It's really easy to think of complaints as something incredibly negative. Um, and I think in Australia and New Zealand, we have a culture that's not about complaining. People will wander off, people won't tell you something's wrong, but they won't actually pick up the phone as a role and bore you out. Um, in some ways, that feels much nicer, but a complaint is a magical thing because it lets you deal with the problem now. It lets you avoid that customer going away and telling 20 friends that there was a problem. Um, and it lets you get better. So by trying to make sure that your customers know they've got a complaint mechanism, and feel that you, know, you really do appreciate getting feedback about problems, um, it'll let you get better and it'll make your customers feel happier. And once again, I think it was Gavin talking, no, sorry, somebody else talked about celebrating success, but making sure you congratulate everybody at the end of the project so that they know it's done, especially if your team has some people that work at the front end, they often don't see the end to end. So getting them involved at the end to say, hey, look, it's up, it's done, the customer's happy, yay team and also involving the customer in that, so that they know that you're excited as well. Um, you know, show it on your social media, make a thing of it. Uh, it's a nice way of finishing that project on a high note. Um, one thing I just want to come back to again, because I think it's incredibly important, it's not just about making your, your client happy, it's about making their customer happy, because if their customer's not happy, their customer won't buy and it, you know, the client won't stay happy. So you've got to think customer satisfaction at two levels, your client and their customer. Oh, apparently I'm also advertising the feedback form. So <laughs> I'll go back there. Um, if anybody's got any questions, I'm more than happy to take them. Otherwise, happy hour awaits. Thank you very much, Kim.